going to dive into week two of this detox. Um, if you were here last week, we kind of opened the idea, and we're going to review some of that. This week, we're going to just edge into it. And this week, we're going to hear a story that I think is a very interesting story. It's a kind of a popular one, so you may have heard parts of it, but I guarantee you, you probably haven't read the whole thing because it takes place over like an entire book of the Bible. Like, uh, so it's a big story. There's a lot that happens in it. We're going to talk a lot about it and kind of see what we can understand from this person in Scripture and what we can understand about ourselves in this regard and what God is trying to show and speak to us in multiple ways. And so we've started this journey of detox. What is a detox? That is a modern word. You're not going to find it in Scripture. It in scripture would be something called fasting. Who's ever heard of fasting, right? And the most popular form of fasting right now is that of like an exercise fast, right? We use this example, the super shredded dude that's like intermittent fasting is the key. If you drink water at 6 a.m. with two drops of lemon and then don't eat and drink a cup of coffee at 8.55 and then like, then your body resets itself and this intermittent fast will get you shredded in 30 days. Everybody's like, yes, I need this information. Um, just click on YouTube, and you're going to find somebody that guarantees that it works, and then you're going to find millions of other people that said, no, it didn't. Um, <laughs> but more often than not, it's not that those things don't work. It's that the people didn't do the work. And that's kind of the same thing in our spiritual walks. So when we talk about fasting, we're talking about a spiritual idea. We're talking about an idea of fasting and, and re re removing something in the natural and replacing it with something spiritual in our lives to help us gain view of who God is, understand who he is. It's not this thing that we're dieting over here. It's not this thing to try to achieve something. It is a response to the understanding of who God is. Now, only in the last hundred years or so has the idea of fasting left the church, left people who believe. If you rewind like over a hundred years ago, you're going to find it was kind of a normal practice for people who were believers that they did it pretty regularly for a day or three days or whatever that, that, that they, they sensed and felt like God led them to. They would do this thing, this weird, odd thing. Think about this for a minute. If you don't find this weird, that means you have been churched. And that's a good and a bad thing all simultaneously. If you do not find it weird that someone says, hey, there's this thing called God that has created all things and all this, and that's cool. And you know what I've got to do about that? Not eat. That doesn't make sense if you're not aware. If that just makes perfect sense to you, you've just heard this so often that just like weird things are normal to you, or you're weird, or both. That is not normal, right? Like to, to, to say, I've learned something, I've understood something, but I don't quite know what to do with it, so the only thing I know to do is to stop doing the one thing that seems to keep me alive. In Scripture, it's always something like that. It's usually having to do with food. There's a few other instances that it's not. In our day and age, we have many, many things that we think we cannot live without. Many, many things that we think we cannot live without. Some people... Just over the last three days, we had all that snow. And they're like, I cannot live without my children going to school. Get them away. Some of us maybe lost power. Did anybody lose power for a little bit? And we were, what, in our day and age, power is like just as essential as food. Wi-Fi even more. The only reason we need power is to get Wi-Fi. And so this, this idea of fasting being only food is not really necessarily the whole idea. The idea is this is something in the natural that I deem very important to me. I kind of do my life around these things. Who knows what you're going to do on Thursday, March 8, 2057? I can guarantee you a couple of things you're going to do. You're going to eat, right? Probably go to the bathroom. If not, see a doctor. And you're going to sleep, like those are three things guaranteed as long as you're alive, you're going to do. I'll be celebrating my 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, that's a part of what I'll be doing. But I know I have no clue what I'm going to do because I could be in a wheelchair for all I know. But I know I'm going to eat. I know I'm going to sleep. Right? So the idea of this, this is something I schedule my life around. It's something essential to my existence. And the idea that fasting does spiritually is says, I'm going to take that thing that seems to be my sustaining source of life to breathe, to live. And I'm going to say, it's actually not. It's one of the things, but it's not the most important things. So I'm going to set that aside for a time so I can come over here and look at things that is what I would say is the real stuff of life. 
The parts of life that can't be put under a microscope and explained, but yet are more true than really all of that stuff. Because really, this side of us, this internal dialogue that we have, uh, and, and this spiritual nature of who we are, really trumps natural things. Do you want me to prove it to you? Because everything you do in the natural is actually driven by your internal being. For instance, you not wanting to wake up in the morning is driven by an internal thought that you have that you don't have to wake up in the morning because you're tired and you want to not do that thing. It's an internal dialogue. You may say, well, it's because I'm naturally tired. Yes, but the decision comes from within. So this decision, this inward decision piece of you, now some of you are saying that's not very spiritual. No, 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 it's just the surface level. But as you keep going, you find out that every decision you make in life is driven from an internal thing that you are. We typically would call it your conscience, right? What stops most of you from killing your spouse or your children or your friend or whatever? Some of you would say, well, it's the law. Actually, it's not. What stops you from stealing something right now when we all leave? No one watches. Half the time this building's left open by some nature. What stops you from seeing $100 and taking it. No one's gonna know. It's not the law. Even if they did know, that threat of some kind of repercussion is not really the thing that stops you. There's something inside of you, whether it be because you've learned it culturally or something else that tells you no to this. But there's also something that tells you, for instance, every time you drive down the road and you see someone stopped on the side of the road, every single one of you at a, there's a moment, it's a, it's a quick moment, because most of the time fear takes over or something else takes over, but there's this quick moment inside that says, there's help needed. Has anyone ever experienced that? Tell the truth. Yeah, it's probably good. Or you, you've just seen something. You see a child in need. You see a family. There's something just for a split second before you start to override with your brain of, well, I shouldn't stop because what if they're a rapist and they're just trying to catch me? That's what you've been told. Or how about this? Oh, someone else will stop. I'm late for work or I gotta do this, right? But there's this split moment in second where inside of you, involuntary to your own thought processes and will, there's a split moment that says, reach out and help. Yeah? And every single one of us, that is showing us that this thing we call conscience, or I would like to call it just your spirit, inside of there is actually the thing that's driving it, and when you overrule it with your own ideas and things like that, you are still driving it from something internal, not from something natural. You have been taught by science and all this kind of stuff, which I'm not a science denier. I follow the science. Just a joke, okay? But <laughs> I'm not saying science doesn't tell us things or anything like that, whatever like that, right? But you have been told that everything you are can be boiled down and put under a microscope and says, here it is. You don't actually have desire for that person. What it is is the chemical things in your brain and the pheromones that they put off and da 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 And so that's really all it is. And it's just an evolutionary thing. Well, that makes no sense because evolution says the strongest survives, so why would someone want to give their life for someone else? Well, it's for the greater good of the community. That's not evolutionary possible because evolution says you be strong and you move forward. Evolution says the opposite. But yet there's something inside of us that says no. In place, I should be the one. That is the internal piece of who you are. That's the real stuff of who you are. And this spiritual detox is simply saying, well, if that is it, I don't listen to that very often. Who, who would agree with that? There should be lots of hands raised right now. I don't listen to that very often at all. And if that's really the true thing and that's really the real thing, I should probably start trying to figure out what that is. And so detoxing or fasting is that. It's the mechanism, it's the way that we say, okay, I'm really focusing on these things over here. And while they feel and seem to be very true, and they are to some respect, they also seem to be not so true and, and not so fulfilling. So I'm going to push that aside and then come over here and really start focusing and thinking over here. I'd like to use music as a quick example before I move on. How many people have ever taken a music lesson? Piano, something like that. Back in the old days, it was like everybody, like, you know, everybody had to learn an instrument or something to, to an extent. Who did more than one of those? 
<laughs> the hands went to like 60% at this point. And who currently is an active, avid musician? Now, when I say active and avid musician, I mean basically give or take 48 hours to 72 hours does not go by before you pick up an instrument or before you're thinking about music or when you're even listening to music, like, ooh, I can play this to this. And now all of a sudden it goes down. But who would love to be a phenomenal musician? And here is the answer of spirituality. I want to be a Christian. I want to be like Christ. Cool. What are you doing? I don't know. I said the prayers. And that, was... that would be like someone thinking because you went and bought a guitar, you are now a musician. Man, Guitar Center would be the most profitable company. They would capsize Apple with how much money they would make just because I bought the guitar and I've got it. This is the idea in our spiritual walks is we've been told that this is not really the true you. And then in kind to that, we say, well, then it doesn't really deserve any time, effort, and energy. Moreover than that, I'm not even really going to have a plan on how it happens. It's just going to happen through osmosis. Over the time that I just live life, I'll all of a sudden wake up one day, look in the mirror, and be like, man, I've got a beard, and I'm wearing a sash. I look like they got Jesus. Now, it's a joke because you don't physically change. That would take exercise in doing all that fasting stuff that we just talked about in the natural. No. Everything else in life, you put effort, intent, and thought, and plan into, don't you? Everything. Matter of fact, all week long, all I was doing was trying to make plans for the next day just in case school was out and this was out. What do we got to do? Okay, academy's closed. This is going to close. What are we going to do that? How am I going to get the videos out for the discipleship stuff? Because we have horrible internet. And I'm, all I'm doing is planning constantly to make sure what I need to happen, what I think is important to happen, happens. Everything. Even when you want to have downtime, what do you do? You schedule your downtime. Otherwise, who is honest? It never happens. I'm about to fix lots of your marriages either before you get to this point or after you do. Most marriages break apart because of they drift apart. Why? There has been no plan to maintain the relationship. There is no plan to say, I'm going to make sure that I at least say hello to you today. There is no plan to say, I'm going to make sure that we talk about the real stuff of life. I'm going to make sure that we agree on this or that, right? So there you go. Free marriage advice. You don't even got to go pay all this money to all these people that are going to tell you nonsense. It's just because you had no plan. You want to know why? It wasn't that important to you. You know what is important to you based off of how you plan and schedule your life. Do you not? So for instance... If we see somebody that is just, man, they're loyal to their job. They show up sick or feeling well. It doesn't matter why. It is important to them. Probably not their job. Probably the paycheck at the end of the week. But it's regardless, the whole reason. And everything in their life revolves around this idea. This thing takes precedence before I go to do this thing. Are you seeing this? And so fasting is saying I've got to shift that and create a new thing because this is the real stuff of life. Proverbs 4.23 is a great scripture. And Proverbs 4.23 says it this way. I'm going to read it in the Living Translation. It says, above all, guard your heart. And when you're reading ancient texts and stuff, the word heart very, very rarely, like probably a handful of times, does it mean you're liter literal, like anatomically correct, that heart. Okay? doesn't ever really mean that. It's always referring to the inner part of who you are. We would call that your spirit or your soul. It says, above all, guard and protect that thing. And what does it say? Because out of that are all of the influences of life. Out of that thing is what shifts and influences you to decide what is important, what is not important. Where you set your desire and affection determines what you plan for. And we, in our spiritual walks, have never even been told or thought about the fact that you should kind of have a game plan as to how you're, what you're going to do. Have you? Now, I, I don't know about you guys. I was born in the church. Like, if these were the same chairs, I probably was almost literally born on the front row. But that idea that, hey, 
you want to be like Christ, you should probably think about this and put some intent behind it and come up with a game plan as to what you're going to do. Now, some of you right now are thinking that I'm saying you have to earn God's affection. I have not once mentioned anything about God's affection and desire for you. That has not even entered the conversation. So you're adding things to what I just said. I didn't say anything about that. That's a whole other conversation that we'll get to in a minute. The idea is that I want to see this thing. I want to understand this truth. So thus, I'm going to put some action behind it. Not because I'm trying to achieve God's affection, but because I'm trying to look at this thing and say, this is important. I want to understand it. Because this is important to me. I'll make time for it. One of the oldest, greatest sayings for me is, if something's important enough to you, you'll find the time for it. Just period. Right? That's just how it is. I know y'all are like, man, this first thing in the morning, can we not sing a song first? It makes me feel better. You all just said amen and agreed to me that your feelings are irrelevant. What is this? It's saying, wow, I must need to reevaluate. Detoxing and removing the influences, because if, if within your heart influences everything in life, whatever you got in there is what's going to influence you. So for instance, <laughs> now, keep this in balance, America. Okay. For instance, that moment on the side of the road when you thought about stopping to help that person. Now, if everyone goes out of here thinking, oh, my game plan to, uh, to get God's affection and desire and to prove that I'm a Christian is to stop and help people on the road because he used that example. No, it's an example. And there's better examples, but you're still asleep, so I'm using a simple one, okay? That moment when you're like, help them, and then the next thing that comes up more often than not, and the next thing that conquers that and you think about for the rest of your drive to work and then you go tell people that you saw somebody but you didn't stop and help because you know you never know all of those thoughts that come immediately after are showing you what you've got in your heart it's showing you your view of humanity it's showing you your view of all of that just take it and look at it so initially it was help my fellow man the next thing is, is oh, you know what they're probably doing? In the back of their car right now, they've got ropes, and they've got a gun, and they're just acting like their tire's flat, and then what they're going to do is right when I stop, as soon as there's not a lot of cars, they're going to shove me into the back and tie my hands up, and then they're going to drive off, and they're going to hold me for ransom, or then I'm going to get sold into sex slavery and all this kind of stuff, and you go down this whole line of thought for the next 20 minutes in the road. Yes, even the guys, I see like some of them, not the guys. Yeah, even the guys. The guys may just think sometimes like, well, now I'm going to have to use the gun that I've got. Or you know what? I'm kind of out of shape. He looks pretty in shape, and so I don't know if I could beat him or not, right? And when this whole thing comes up, where does all that come from? That's what you've got to influence and base your decision off of. Because that's the primary thing you've been putting in. Now, again, I'm not talking against the news or anything like that. But that's because the primary thing you think is important is your natural life. So thus you value that over anything else, over the kingdom of God or anything else like that. And then the second thing that you do is what have you been hearing? You've been listening to that, listening to that. So that has now become true to you. Whether or not it's actually true, right? Who's ever heard this? You say something long enough, it becomes true. And that is a true statement because someone said it long enough. And people now believe it to be true. Yep, you say it long. It does. And it does. Does that make it like factually true? No, but it makes it true to everyone else. And thus people now develop and devote their life to that thought process. We used an example last Sunday about this idea of fuel. It's whatever fuel you put in, that's what gets burned off, right? Now I use the example that I used to drive a little Mini Cooper and they're quite finicky. And I was just, I was taught and it was true to me that there's no difference in those three gasolines that you put in your car. No difference at all. They just mark it up more because they're trying to make more money. That's what I was told. I believed it to be true. So thus, that's what I did. Guess what? After two or three tanks of that thing, that sucker did not run the same way at all. And then when I started putting the right fuel in it over time, it's like, hey, it's starting to act right again. There's your life spiritually right there. There's your life. It's like, it's working. It just ain't working like right. And by the way, if you think working means your life is all rainbows and unicorns and bulletproof mar marshmallows, that is not working. That is your version of comfort and laziness, which has nothing to do with your existence whatsoever. We'll leave that to the side. But that is it. Is that then in the moments when you're supposed to be, be able to, to, if you can think of it this way, burn off something spiritual, all you've got in the tank is trash. That's all you got. So that's all you can use. That is, the, that is just your response. Has anyone ever wondered when you've met somebody that just, it seems, 
that they just either always know what to say to certain types of questions or right, like someone, I'll use an example. I'm going to pick on Mike because I pick on other people a lot and he picks on me a lot. So. You know, Mike's an electrician. I bet there's not a question about electricalness stuff that, <laughs> that you could ask that he doesn't have an answer to. His answer may be, well, I know this part, but, right, but, but you go to Levi and he's just going to say, don't touch the wire. That's, that's the extent of what he knows. But he's going to act like, I guarantee you, that boy acts like he knows everything. I don't know where he gets that from. <laughs> but he will respond with trash. He will, and he'll sit there, um, well, um, you know, what, what I think here is, uh, and it, he's, in the back of his mind, he's just trying to say, I don't really know the answer, but I'm going to come up with something. <laughs> Brian's getting too much of a kick out of that. But that's your spiritual life. You're full, like you just, and you think, you look at that person that actually knows the answer and be like, oh, well, they just think they're not. No, there's time, effort, and energy, devotion, years in the making that caused him to know just how to respond that way. He doesn't even have to try. It's just who he is. He's just, what do we say? He's an electrician. And this is, what it's, this is what we mean with a game plan to influence your life, this replacement of fasting. It's not because you're trying to achieve God's care, love, and devotion and pleasure out of it. It's because what you're doing is saying, no, I want to be that. And so to be that, I've got to have a game plan to develop not just the intellectual, spiritual understanding, but to where my responses to things just seem to be the responses of Jesus. I don't even have to think about it. It's just what happens. Now, does that happen immediately? No. It's over a long period of time. And guess what? Sometimes, even though you've been traveling down that path, you forget a little bit. Does that mean when Mike doesn't know the answer to a question, does that mean he's an elect not an electrician anymore? When Mike messes up and blows something up in the church, because <laughs> he crosses a wire, does that mean Mike has a failure, we're ripping your license away, and you're not an electrician anymore? No. So by the name of God, why do we think that way about our spiritual walk? That the second, because you just haven't done it good enough, that you are no longer now in the process of becoming a musician. I'm going to give you guys a hint. I'm about to be over here and play some music with you guys. Hopefully that music turns into worship. That's a different conversation. But I'm going to play some music, and I guarantee you I'm going to hit more than one wrong note. Guaranteed. On the guitar and in my voice is more guaranteed. Yeah, because we're singing in a woman's key for Ariel. So Jared's going to be loud. Screaming, make a joyful noise to the Lord, okay? Does that make me not a guitarist or a singer? No. So why do we think that? Because we didn't follow through to the intent that we had, that now we're completely disqualified <laughs> First off, again, we think we're disqualified from the love, care, and devotion of God, and that is not even in our conversation that we're talking about right now, but that's what we get, keep going back to. Or the next thing that we do is we think, well, now we're not qualified to be a part of this, so now I'm going to shrink away from it. That would be like as soon as I play a wrong note on a guitar, I say, well, now I can't play guitar for six months because I'm never going to get it. i gotta, I got to take a break from it. I'm not worthy to pick up the guitar. This was not in my notes, so this is for somebody. This is what the fasting is trying to do. It's say, replace this view of natural things, swap it with this spiritual thing over here, and then it will grow. Take some time, but it will grow. And one day you'll look up and just be like, wow, I kind of react differently to that. Didn't even notice it. Okay, other people will. You probably won't. If you notice it first, that just means you're staring in the mirror too long at yourself, by the way. Okay, that was just for fun. All of this, you will never find this to be valuable if you don't understand one core thing, and then I'm going to tell you the story. I said this last week, this is something, you can write it down 15 times, it would probably do you good. You know how you used to have to do spelling words and write them three times, right? Make this like your spelling word and write this down. You are spirit. It's what you are. You just happen to have a physical body. You are not a physical body that then somehow has this thing called a spirit or a soul. 
You are this. That is the very nature of what you are. That is the categoric thing that makes you different than the rest of creation is that peace. That piece of you is the only part of you that has the ability to commune with the being that we call God that created all things. That piece of you. That's the real you, right? Think about it. Our world is obsessed with people trying to see the real you. What do we mean? If you were just body and that was all you were, we see the real you when you're naked. So we're going to become a nudist colony. No. Jacob, put your hand down, bro. (laughs) Think about that. I'm trying to urge you to think and understand the reality of the spiritual side of you. Because this world is obsessed with expressing yourself and who you really are. But if all you really were was a computing meat bag, that could, you're just a sack of meat that can compute information. The real you, when physically naked, is now we see really all you are. Or we could cut you open and really see the insides of who you are. But that's not what we mean at all in this world, is it? When we say, I don't, you don't, you're not hearing me. You don't see my heart. You don't, what is that appealing to? The idea that the real part of me is not this natural thing that you're experiencing and seeing. It's something else. That is called spirit. You are that. And we're obsessed with trying to get people to see that. Showing us that is true. That is real. I would argue it is even more real than the physical. Just the physical seems to be more in your face. And so fasting, this detoxing, is this idea that you are spirit with a body. So let's stop fueling only this natural concepts of things. Let's get rid of some of that so we can kind of start growing this real inside of who we are. And this inside of who we are has this gravitational pull in the opposite of the way gravity pulls. And it's trying to pull us towards God. Now, not literally like floating up to heaven, okay? That is an analogy of, to a higher idea. It has this this kind of predisposition, if you will. It's kind of just programmed to travel in that direction when you begin to say, all right, God, if this is real, let's start talking. But it takes a plan. It takes an idea to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. Now, I'm not saying a plan. This is, well, you better do 30 minutes a day, and then if you don't do 30 minutes a day, then you're not worthy. Now you've went back to the other dumb idea. This is not the intent. Now, we've got to start doing this spiritual walk and spiritual life on purpose. It's got to be on purpose. It doesn't just happen by osmosis. It's got to be a decision and doing it on purpose. Just like parenting doesn't happen just by osmosis. Otherwise, your kids run around like hellions. Your marriage doesn't just happen by osmosis. Otherwise, it falls apart in five years or less. If you've made it past five years, that's just because there's a little stick to and probably social things of you don't want to be a failure in marriage, so you just kind of keep it going. Or you're doing it on purpose. Friendships don't happen by osmosis, do they? One of my best friends I haven't got to hang out with in a year. You want to know why? Because I ain't been very planful with my friendship. So if I'm real with myself, it must not be that important to me. We have to do it on purpose. Now there's a guy that we're going to talk about. His name's Elijah. I'm going to tell you the story of Elijah. It starts off in 1 Kings chapter 17. And I'm going to summarize for you chapter 17, 18, and 19. I'm going to summarize all three chapters for you. There's a lot that happens in this story. But before we read what Elijah begins to do, we've got to put our mind as if, what did, how did Elijah think? Like, what was his worldview? Y'all know what I mean by that? It's like, you got to kind of think like he thought, otherwise you won't understand why he did the things that he did. For instance, if you don't understand the way I think about, you know, how things should be at my house, and you know, well, let's actually use Taryn, <laughs> how, what clean actually means. Levi, are you listening? What clean actually means You won't ever do it, and you won't understand why she wants it done a certain way. I can't tell you how many times she understands what what what, how she thinks about things and what clean really means. And so, to her, and this is proper, just so you know, if y'all don't do this, I'm also giving you cleaning advice right now. You don't sweep and mop the floor, then do the countertops, because what's on the countertops gets back on the floor. So you start 
Get the dishes all done because you're going to make a mess. Then you get all the countertops clean and wiped down. Then you sweep and you mop. Yes? But you'll never understand why to do it in that way if you don't understand what they mean. So we're going to look real quick. I'm going to kind of give you a really general idea of what Elijah had to have thought like a little bit. And then we're going to read and you'll see why he does what he does. See, to Elijah, this spirit idea that we were just talking about was true and worth everything. His idea and belief was that God, he would have called him Yahweh God, that God, the creator of all things, the guy that in Genesis 1-1 created everything, the unseen and the seen realm, that that God is committed to seeing the earth look like heaven. So much so, and it doesn't look like that, that he has ordained and given Elijah the authority, you can call it power, but the mission, can we say it that way? That that God that is so real that the mission of my life is to bring about the things that he says to bring about at whatever cost. And that one day there's going to be another guy come that's called the Messiah, or we call him the Christ. And then one day that's going to happen and it's going to show everybody how to do this. And that was so core to his belief that he was willing to do and risk anything to see it happen. And so when he comes on the scene, this driving force that he is a spirit over natural things and that he is supposed to bring about the work that God had done at the beginning, that good work, he's supposed to be a part of it. He's supposed to bring it to start looking the way God intended it to look from the beginning. And one day there's going to be a guy that comes and does it to the nth degree in, in, in an internal, in-person view. That's going to happen, but I've got to prepare the way and I've got to do this work to turn people to see who God is. That drove everything about Elijah, for the most part. And so he comes on the scene with one of the craziest beginnings of a story ever, in my view. Imagine, y'all ever watch those shows where they're just like start in the middle and you're like, what was happening before this guy was just killing that guy? Y'all ever watch those shows? Like it just opens up and you're like, who's that? Who's that? What's happening right now? That's kind of Elijah's story. We're just dropped into the fact that this guy goes up to the king Ahab and he says, hey, I'm paraphrasing, remember, if you're reading this verbatim, I'm not literally quoting all three chapters. I am summarizing this. Cliff notes, okay? Elijah for dummies, all right? So this is, this is shrunk down. He comes on the scene, goes, talks to this king Ahab. King Ahab is the king of Israel. He goes to him and says, hey, you've turned away from God and it is not going to rain until I say so. Now, if you don't know, it's a big deal, especially in ancient cultures, for it not to rain for a long period of time. Because guess what happens if it doesn't rain? Things do not grow. Guess what happens if things do not grow? There's no miracle grow back then. You're going to die. Water dries up, right? This, this is not a good thing. And think about that. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know that I'd have the boldness to go up I mean, much less to our government, but to a king, which you could just do whatever he wanted, basically. He'd be like, you're dead. As a matter of fact, ship your body parts to your family. Like, he can do whatever he wants. No one can say anything about it and walk up to him and say, by the way, it's not going to rain. Not until this moment in time, just until I say so. That is someone that is standing over here that this spiritual idea that God told him to do, that this is important. And he stakes everything on it. So as soon as he does it, it says, and then the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, go hide. <laughs> yep. Do that right away, Lord. Let's go. And it says that he goes to this place called the Brook Chair. So like a river that's by the Jordan River. And it says that he goes there and God sustains him for a time in complete solitude by himself, just him and God and some ravens bringing him some food. That's what the Bible says. It says that God prepared and sustained him. And he was there. Y'all see, when, if anyone's ever heard this story before, by the way, you've heard this story and it seems like this happened over like 30 days, years. Read, if you read the story, he's there for a long time. A long time, probably drinking oolong tea for oolong time. He's there for a long time. And he's there just by himself, him and God. And then God says, hey, the time has come. You've been here for a while. You've hang out with me. Yeah, I know. But the river's drying up because it ain't raining. <laughs> Remember? Did you forget that, Elijah? So God says, you need to move on from this place and go to this place called Zarephath. It's, it's a town. And there you're going to find this woman 
and uh, she's going to provide for you. Now, again, if you've heard this story before, you're like, she provides for him for like a day or so, and then he goes on. No, years. He's there for a minimum of three years, could be up to seven. People are kind of split on what the timing looks like there, but years. Now, when he's there with this woman, God provides in another miraculous way. We're not going to go into the details of this, but he provides in another miraculous way. Matter of fact, while he's there, her son dies, and then (laughs) Elijah goes to God. Y'all got to think of it this way. Elijah goes to God, and he says, God, you told me to come here and that you were going to provide, and now her son's dead. You're making me look bad. Bring this kid back to life. It says he's praised that three times, and then the kid comes back to life. That is how most of us pray. God, you're making me look bad. And God's over here saying, I didn't tell you to get to take out that loan. You know, okay. <laughs> you chose that. But no, God moves him to this place of Zarephath where this woman there, and so while he's there for years, God's providing for him again. Notice something already in the story. I just want to point this out, just a little pause. Everywhere he goes, whether it be in solitude or with people, it is because God said, this is where we're going now. Keep that in mind. Okay, unpause story. So while he's there and all these things happen, then it says that God came and said, hey, it's time. Go back to Ahab. Tell him it's about to start raining. But we got to do some things first. This is where the story goes bonkers. Okay? Again, if you find what I'm about to tell you normal, you're an abnormal individual. God says, go back to King Ahab now, that king that's over all of Israel, that they're all worshiping this false god. Actually, two false gods, but we'll just focus on the one. And you've probably heard it, if you've ever heard it before, it's Baal. It's actually pronounced Baal, but Baal. This is a false god that they are worshiping. All the children of Israel are worshiping this. And he goes and tells Ahab, it's about to rain, but something's about to happen. Go get all those prophets, and let's go meet on the mountain. He basically does like a God challenge dance off. He's like, hey, here's what we're going to do. You go get all your prophets, and you come to the top of the mountain, and let them call for a God. Whoever's God answers with fire from heaven, that's who we serve. Agreed? And they're like, fair enough. Baal's not going to fail us now. You know, there's, there's 450 of us that serve Baal, and there's another 400 of us that serve this other God. And they're kind of like, if you look at their mythology, they're like sons. Uh, uh, Baal has a son, and they worship the son of Baal. Okay, so it's kind of weird theology that they're doing. And there's, so, there's like 850 prophets. 850 people versus one dude. Not like in a fight battle, but like in a, we're just going to pray. <laughs> Doesn't this sound weird? And When fire comes down from heaven, that's whose God we're going to serve. Think about that conviction to go and challenge the king plus 850 people and say, fire is going to fall from the sky and light this on fire. That is weird. That is a level of faith and concept that this spiritual thing, what God told me to do, is he is so true that I'm going to literally see fire. Now, don't walk out of here, especially children, and try to call fire down from heaven. If you're going to, just in case God does answer, do it outside, okay? (laughs) But he goes to the top of this mountain. They all come, and he says, go for it. And so they begin this worship, and they take wood. This This is the other prophets. They take wood, and they pile it all up. And they take a calf and they split it all up and cut it all up and do their whatnots. And they set it on there and they begin to pray to Baal. And nothing's happening. I want to read you how Elijah responds because the Bible's kind of funny sometimes too, okay? Let me, let's go to 1 Kings real quick if, if you're following along with me. 1 Kings, uh, this is in uh, chapter 18. This is kind of where I've summarized to thus far. You guys good? Cool. This is a fun story. So we're going to start, I'm going to read it right down here. So they go first, right? And they're over there shouting and everything like that. And about noon, so they've been doing this all day, praying all day to Baal. All these prophets, they're praying all day long. Baal, send fire down from heaven. Prove that you are the God of all gods. And Elijah's sitting over there just watching them. And about noon... I'm assuming it's lunch break for prayer time. I don't know. But he's just over here sitting and watching, and he starts to make fun of them. And this is what he says. This is is funny. This is in the Living Translation. About noon, he began to mock. 
He says, you're going to have to be louder than that to catch the attention of your God. Maybe he's talking to somebody else. He's busy. And he says, maybe he's on the toilet. You just got to give him a minute. <laughs> like, see, serving God can be fun. Also, you're pretty bold to antagonize 850 people. <laughs> like, hey, your God may just be sitting on the can. So you know, just give him a minute. You got to talk louder than that. What else does he say? He says, maybe he's on a trip. Like he's traveled away and he's just not around. He said, maybe he's asleep. Like, he's just like making fun constantly. And so it says, then they shouted louder. They're like, oh, good idea, apparently. And they're like, let's shout louder. And it says they begin to slit their wrists and they're just like doing everything they can to try to get an answer. It says nothing happened. And then Elijah says, hey, y'all come over here real quick. He calls them over and he says, all right, here's what we're gonna do. And he does something interesting. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but he rebuilds the original altar from ancient times before. He gets the 12 stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He puts back together the altar of God because it had fallen into disrepair because the people of Israel had been worshiping Baal for quite some time. So he rebuilds the altar of God right over here on this mountain. And after he does that, he puts the wood there. He digs this huge trench around the whole thing. And then he cuts up a, 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 a calf and then he puts it on the, on the fire. And he says, hey, go get some water. Pour it on this. Now, I don't know if you guys know. But water puts out fires, just to make sure you guys know that. And so he pours water on it, and he says, hey, go do it again. So they pour water on it again. I also want you to remind you, it has not been raining. So water, yeah, he was very confident. (laughs) And so he does this, and then he goes and he turns and he prays. And he basically, what scripture shows us is he prays just one simple prayer. And his prayer has this core understanding and idea, which is something we could learn from. He says, God, (laughs) again, I kind of imagine it. He says, like, remember we, this challenge thing, you got to come through for me because Ahab wants to kill me and he's the king and he can and 850 people, I got to run all, outrun all of them. So you better answer. And he says, but don't answer for my sake. He says, answer that all the people of Israel know who you are, and they see you, and they turn back to you, so do it. It says, fire came down from heaven, consumed all the wood, the calf, everything, the the wet wood and everything. And then it says the the thing around it, all that water, it was such an intense heat, it burned everything and the stones. So I find it funny, if you guys don't know this, there's archaeologists like, we need to find these 12 stones. And they're supposed to be believers. If you read the story, it says the stones are now gone. So I don't know what they're looking for, but it says the stones, everything, such an intense heat, it's all consumed. And then guess what happens? Everybody's like, yep, that's who we're going to serve. And then here's where it gets really crazy. Elijah says, get all the prophets together. And it says Elijah kills them all. Very Game of Thrones. Like, I guess that's one way to fill back up the rivers is with 850 people's blood. I don't know. But he kills them all. All the prophets that were serving this other God kills them all. And then Ahab and Elijah are like, let's go back to the palace because we're all turning back to God. When he gets there, the queen, who was really the kind of the, one of the main causes of everybody starting to worship this other God, her name is Jezebel, if you've ever heard that name. She, Ahab's like telling her what just happened, which I don't know about you guys, but if my wife came and started telling me a story of, Jared, you're worshiping the wrong God, and here's how I know. First off, just that guy's going to kill everybody, so let's just leave that alone for a minute. But moreover than that, literal fire just came down from heaven, and like I watched stones melt and disappear. Like You would think your response would be like, okay. But no, her response is, Elijah, I'm going to kill you before today is over. And so what does Elijah do? Deuces, and he takes off, and he runs. He goes out into the wilderness. When he's out in the wilderness, in solitude again, God provides for him again. It says the angel of the Lord came and provided him with food, with bread, and with water. And this happens a couple times, and then the angel tells him, hey, you need to eat this, because it's a long journey to where you're headed, specifically a 40-day situation. Now, it was not a 40-day journey, but it was just a 40-day time period where he then fasted for 40 days on a mountain, just him and God in solitude. But then at the end of that 40 days, 
I'm almost done with the story. We're getting into, into chapter 19 right now. Y'all seeing? There's a lot that happens. Elijah had a crazy, and this is just the first part of his story. Wait till you read all the rest of Kings and Second Kings where his story kind of comes to an end. He has some crazy things. Like this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg for Elijah. And so at the end of this 40 days, from not eating and everything like that, he's on this mountain. He basically says, God, Everybody wants to kill me. I'm done. Kill me now. I got to die at some time. Might as well be right now. Just, I'm done. Kill me. That's his prayer. He says, I'm the only one that's serving you, God. So just kill me. Then it says that God appears in several different ways, like an earthquake happens and lightning and, and fire. All this stuff happens. It says, but that was, God was not in it. Says, but then he goes out to like, what is going on? Like, I just prayed a prayer. <laughs> you, and you think, again, in his mind, he's like, oh no, it's like, you just prayed to die. Here's an earthquake, bro. Like, I don't know. Like, but <laughs> it, he goes out and it says, then the voice of God comes as a still small voice. Who's ever heard God speaks in a still small voice? This is the one scripture it says that. It says, God speaks in a still small voice to him and he says, what are you doing here? Now that's Jared's version, but it says, why are you here, thouest? I think it says, why are thou here? But whatever. <laughs> it says, why are you here? And then he just prays the same prayer again. God, I'm the only one that's serving you. That's why I'm here. Everybody's trying to kill me. So just kill me. I've done my job. Just kill me. And God says, why are you here? Right now, in this moment, why are you here? And God tells him, get off this mountain, get off your tail, go. And he tells him to anoint the king of Israel and anoint this other king. And he says, and then go find this dude named Elisha. Not Elijah, Elisha. He says, go find that guy. He's going to basically be your apprentice. Not like sorcerer's apprentice, weird witchcraft stuff. But like just, he's going to now follow you around and be a part of what you're doing because he's going to take up when you're, when you're dead. You're going to die, Elisha. <laughs> like, it's going to happen, just not right now. Some of you, I know, y'all are going down on another side. Yeah, it's going to happen, okay? So, he is told to do this, and then God says, and I'm, been, I'm paraphrasing, so read it, but God says, by the way, I've got 7,000 prophets that have not bowed their knee to Baal. You ain't the only one, but if you get your tail out of here and go do what I said to do, they can all come out of hiding, but no one can right now. Because that hadn't happened yet. So then it says, guess what Elijah does? Makes the long trek back and then begins to do this. And the next chapter, chapter 20, is the continuation of what he begins to do. He finds Elisha and so on and so forth. So if you want to read it, you can read it all. I highly recommend you read the whole story because I, I kind of skipped over some parts that are not pertaining to what we're talking about. This guy named Obadiah, who is also a prophet, he's kind of in this story too. He's also over in the story of Jonah, so you kind of can see how they're all working together. It's pretty interesting, right? So... Go read it. But this is the general part of the story. But what I want to do is I want to hone in on one specific piece of this. What are the stories in the Bible given to us for? They're given to us to understand the nature of God and who he is, and then the nature of man and how we tend to respond to God for good and bad. And while Elijah, in so many respects, we would call him a successful guy in his spiritual walk, you just saw he also stumbled and fell. But what I want to show you is the flip side coin that everything God asks of us. You remember how fasting is this idea of replacing something in the natural and shifting it and going spiritual? Yes? God is on that other side wanting to do the replacement with you. It is not just you replacing God is saying, when you do that, I'll exchange with you too. And everything that is exchanged, God's going to restore in a new way. Every single thing. So in the place of solitude, God's going to shift and restore that with a sense of community. He's going to put it in the flip side. But 
It needs to be in the manner that God is intending. In a place of solitude, when it's just you and God, like we talked about last week, in fasting, removing other influences, when it's just you and God, the initial first thing is to feel alone maybe, to feel unheard and unseen. And God says, I want to replace that with a relationship that you've never experienced before. Matter of fact, you, it would take every relationship you've ever known and all culminated together in the goodness of all of them just to start edging on what type of relationship I'm talking about. It would take the understanding of the intimacy with your spouse and the love you have for your children and the love that you have for your friends and that all of that. It would take all of that combined just to start edging on what I'm trying to replace that with. But it takes being in this place of solitude first. Solitude does, in my view, two basically core things. Number one, it creates focus. And number two, it allows freedom. Because see, when you're alone and by yourself, who does not sing in front of people? Come on, raise your hand. Most of you don't. (laughs) But who in the car, if no one else is around, the people driving beside you down the highway are like, they are either yelling or screaming at somebody. So what is going on in that car beside? Yeah. Why? Freedom. There's no one around. When you're in solitude with God, it creates focus because you've removed all of the other distractions and desires and you're saying, no, it's just me and you. I want to get to know you. You get to know me. And he's like, yeah, I already know. Like everything you think I don't, I know. I just want you to start getting to know me so we can kind of work together in harmony. And then it creates freedom because when you're with that God that I'm talking about that already knows the inner depths of who you are, that part of you that you wish everyone else could see and you're trying to express, he's like, I know. You have the freedom to express it. But that's the replacement of the solitude that God wants to bring and allow you to focus and allow you to have freedom. And he says, moreover than that, I'll also replace it with a community that looks just like that. A community of people focused, completely free. We call this the church. And I would say to all of us that have ever been a part of the church, if you don't see the idea of a focused group of people focused on one thing, Psalms 1-1 tells us, blessed is the man that walks not in the council of the godly, sits in the way of sinners, stands in the way of sinners, sorry, sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates. His focus is God. That's the focus of the church. The spirit of God. Christ being a part, centered on that idea He says, I want to give you a community that's focused on that one thing, just like you're being focused in that sense of solitude. I want to replace it, and we are in relationship. I want to replace that loneliness with a relationship you've never understood, never heard. I want to do that, and then I want to give you a community of people that are doing the same thing, being focused on me, and then there's immense freedom. So if you look and you say, that doesn't seem like a church I've ever been a part of. It wasn't God's church. It wasn't God's community. It wasn't one founded from this first piece of replacement of saying, I want him above all else. He says, that's what the church is supposed to be. And it drives us. Those of us that are on the inside, it should drive us to express more freedom and more focus on who he is because just looking at who he is, it just makes you want to know more. And then when there's a group of people doing that, all of us on the outside, those of us on the outside look and say, there's something about that. There's something about the way of that that I want to be a part of. And that is where we get to, because we've been diligent, we don't spew trash about electricity and make up stuff. We say, I can tell you exactly what this is and exactly how we got here through the person of Christ. I, I, I know this, and I can express this to you. And this 
is the replacement God wants to begin. But it starts with detoxing from all of that. Not because social media is bad or because, you know, you shouldn't eat food because you're just getting heavy. Or you shouldn't depend on cigarettes or alcohol or blah, blah, blah. No, that's not the reason. The reason is because I see something about me that is very true, that is very spirit. That's the real me, and I want to grow that piece. And I want that to influence all of my sections of life. I want that to be my determining factor of life. And so I will remove that to gain that. And God says, let's exchange. If you're unaware, the whole way that this exchange happens is through the person of Christ, and we've talked about him, and we will continue to talk about him for, like, till I stop talking. Not, like, just today, like, ever. Like, till I'm, like, Elijah, and, like, kill me now, God! You know, until that happens. God wants to replace with you. And the cool thing is, guys, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, the denial of your, your natural desires, the fasting, he wants to replace with something scripture calls feasting. The exact reverse of that. Every time God says, I want to replace it because I want to show you what my kingdom looks like when it's here on earth. So this is the thing that drives us. So this morning, whether or not you've ever attempted any kind of fasting or plan in your spiritual walk, I challenge you to begin that. To begin to search and say, God, I'm going to, I'm going to detox. I'm going to fast because I want to do that exchange with you. Or if you're someone that has played around with it multiple times, I want to go to God with it. Don't go to other people. Remember, solitude. It's you and God. I know that's scary. I know. Trust me. Some of you are like, I cannot trust my own thoughts. Never trust your own thoughts. They're usually not a good idea. Now, I'm talking about the real stuff of life. I'm not talking about your own thoughts of how to build something. I'm talking about the real stuff, the spiritual side. Trust God's thoughts. And the only way you can even begin to understand that is to remove every other thought that's not his. That starts with all the ones that you can control. Everyone else. Shh. Everyone. Now all you got to contend with is yours and God's. That's the beginning journey to it. Because of the reality that you are spirit, that is the real stuff of who you are. And that came from the spirit, the ultimate spirit, the God of all things, seen and unseen, that thought it was a good idea to partner with us to say, keep my good work going here on earth. So it says, for that, I'll replace. Because this is not worth near as much to me as that is. (laughs) 